This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 975, recorded on January 13th, 2023. I didn't realize it was Friday the 13th. Holy cow. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi, it's great to be here. It is currently 44, cloudy, just not great outside. It's been raining all week. Uh, so happily I'm inside doing this. Yeah, raining all week. It's kind of miserable. <laughs> also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Uh, it's uh, pretty similar here, overcast, 52 Fahrenheit, 11 Celsius. And just blech. It was off and on storming last night. And now it's just kind of all blowing through. We have, we have a guest for you today uh, from a place where the weather is always good. She's from the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Daniela Weisskopf, welcome. To Thank, you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. It's currently 65, cloudy. And uh, we have rain in the forecast, so not always good. <laughs> You're not getting flooded, are you? No. Okay. Um, I, I, saw, I met you at uh, Seattle not too long ago, right? That's right. And uh, I said, oh, Daniela, I've always meant to have you uh, come on, so let's do it. And, you know, sometimes you need to run into people to, to get you to do that. So I'm glad you could come. And we were just talking. Um, <laughs> I asked Daniela, do you surf? Because everybody surfs, and she apparently does out there because as you'll tell us you used to snowboard right <laughs> yes i am from austria so i'm used to like snow and i thought i can switch to snowboard with a surfboard and it's the same thing but like why was i wrong so no <laughs> it's a whole new thing <laughs> so i do surf but not very good so you don't give up you just keep going back and trying it over and over right that's what you learn as a scientist right that's yeah true. yeah <laughs> when, you, when yeah. you fall you get up and do it again you're absolutely exactly. right yeah do you take lessons? I did take lessons in the beginning from uh, college yeah. here, but yeah, that, that was good. But like, you still need to practice. Well, that's something I will never do. I can tell you that. <laughs> I'll never surf. I've already get hung up my skis. No more snow, snow skiing. That's it. Uh, before we start talking with Daniela, we're going to we have two announcements. First, research assistant position in the laboratory of Amy Rosenfeld. That's at Sieber of the FDA. Uh, Amy's lab works on enteroviruses, like entero 68 poliovirus, rhinoviruses, uh, and they're interested in um, understanding multiple aspects of immune dysfunction associated with infection. The person will carry out experiments in cell culture and participate in development of small animal models for studying aspects of virus infection, including the tissue-specific immune response. And this is all BSL-2 work, and there will be a link to, the, uh, to this position description in the show notes. And you can find there uh, Amy's email where you can email her for more information about the position. And I also want to tell you that registration is now open for ASV 2023, the American Society for Virology, the annual meeting it's going to be in Athens, Georgia. You know, that's the famous place where a lot of uh, rock and roll is recorded. Who, what's the famous band that got started there? Uh, was that the B-52s? I don't you know, know. it might have been, but I'm, I'm thinking of another one. Famous Athens, Georgia band. Let's see if that'll work. Oh, <laughs> R.E.M. Oh, yes, you were right. B-52s, R.E.M., Pylon. And others I've never heard of. But REM was the one I was thinking of, right? Rapid eye movement. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Athens, Georgia, June 24th to 28th. The abstracts are due February 1st. And travel awards for global scholars, which require an abstract, are due January 23. Not too far off. Other travel awards, like trainees, teachers of undergraduate virology, are due February 3rd. Some of these awards require that you're an ASV member, so you have to sign up for that now or while you're working on your abstract. ASV.org slash ASV2023 for more information. 
got to move on that because by the time this drops, it'll be the 15th and you won't have a lot of time. Okay, back to you, Daniela. You mentioned you're from Austria, so you're born and raised there. Is that right? Yes, born and raised in Innsbruck, Austria. It's the western <sighs> part of Innsbruck, of, of Austria. So right between Germany and Italy. Did you ski a lot when you were young? You must yes, have, right? yes. I learned <laughs> skiing when I was like, I think, three years old. Yes. And when I was 14, I switched to snowboarding. So doing snowboarding oh, ever yeah. since. So my PhD advisor, Peter Palese. He's also Austrian, in, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And he oh, he's such a good skier. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I... I went with him once and he went off. He said, I have to go ski with people who know how to ski. <laughs> he actually left me with his wife. He said, you, you two ski here and I'll go with the big boys. And <clears throat> of course, she was really good herself. She was cutting beautiful turns, you know, and everything. So he said he, he skied to school, right? Basically, he oh. would come from his house and ski to, to get to school. I don't know how you do that anyway. I'll okay, so both ways. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you went to how far did your education go in uh, Austria? Would All the way to? to grad school. So I, uh, uh, my undergrad and uh, also PhD, uh, did in Austria University, Medlik University of Innsbruck is where I graduated with my PhD. Um, was that hmm. biology, immunology? Um, kind of what was the focus? So, so my undergraduate was in microbiology, and that's when I first started getting really interested in viruses. And that's when I also started getting interested in like the other side of the, the metal, right? So how does our immune system recognize viruses? So I've always been interested in viruses, not as like a virologist, but like, you know, how, as an immunologist, like how do we recognize viruses? And then I did immunology for my PhD. What types of things did you work on for your PhD? It's actually, um, I always did T-cells. I always looked at viruses. Uh, my focus mm. in my PhD was uh, how our immune system ages, so immunosenescence. So because there is viruses like cytomegalovirus that, you know, we all like accumulate and uh, T-cells accumulate during aging, um, specific for CMV. So that's what I was doing in my PhD. Uh, we we're, heard we're a on a bit of a kick. Yeah, we, we, just had, we just talked about CMV <laughs> all last episode. <laughs> Yes. Delicious episode. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, and I, I have to point that, out in your background, you've got, um, uh, is it an immunology journal or book and then a box of tea? Which this is, is actually, <laughs> it's actually a picture of myself because like, you know, the things that they don't tell you in uh, grad school um, is you have to do all kinds of different jobs when you like <laughs> run your own lab. So this was like uh, during the pandemic when like our institute like had like a little like a magazine and the, I'm on the cover. So mm, things you it. don't know. <laughs> yeah. How did you get interested in science to begin with? Uh, already in high school. So I, I was always interested in um, biology and in chemistry. And then my professor said like, oh, you should study microbiology because that's kind of like the perfect uh, blend. And so I did enroll in uh, microbiology for my undergrad and uh, stuck with it ever since. So. Hmm. And what brought you to the U.S. and when was that? I came to the U.S. in uh, October 2009 and I graduated uh, um, grad school and I wanted to work for Alex Zetta. So I came hmm. uh, to do my postdoc with him. Here and there in La Jolla, right? Yes, there in La Jolla, yeah. And, and so then you've stayed ever since? Stayed ever since, yeah. It's a hard, it's hard place to, to leave. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. I imagine so. <laughs> yeah. I, I understand between the good weather and the surfing. And the good science. <laughs> and the good yeah. science, yes. Okay. Immunology, okay. yes. So you, so you went to work uh, again on T-cells with Alex, right? Continuing yes. your interest, yeah. He had a project on dengue virus so uh -huh. and T-cells, so that hit my my two marks, right? Viruses and T-cells, so that's what I, what I came for here, yeah. And then, of course, in... 2020, everything turned to SARS-CoV-2, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. So I just started my own lab here at the Lahoy Institute, January 2020. So six oh. weeks in, <laughs> six <laughs> weeks in, <laughs> I was uh, working on SARS-CoV-2. Yes. What viruses so were you planning to work on before that? <laughs> so I, I'm always interested in uh, merging viruses. So that was a natural transition. I were, I used to work, and I still work again on uh, infection with dengue virus, Zika virus, chikungunya yellow fever. Mm. So mosquito-borne viruses. Yeah. Okay. And all of those you've left behind for now, right? I So I spent all of 2020 picking it back up, the pieces, get my life back <laughs> from before yeah. COVID. Yes. So, yeah. 
Okay. So I want to talk today mainly about t- your T cell work with SARS-CoV-2. So let's start with the basics. What is a T cell and what does it do? Yeah, so T cells is one part of the immune system that is has been neglected many times, but I think that's one good thing out of the pandemic. People are aware that there's more than antibodies. So T cells um, are part of a cellular immune system, so they help antibodies. Uh, they have different kinds of jobs. There's different flavors. Um, one we call killer cells, one we call helper cells. So they, um, the first flavored CD8 T cells, the killer cells, can actually kill infected cells. So because when the virus is already inside a cell, the antibody cannot help you no more, right? That's when you need like T cells that recognize infected cells and they help clear that. And the other big um, part of T cells is um, the CD4 helper cells, which help actually to make you like, you know, better, high, more higher affinity antibodies against uh, everything really, what infectious disease you ever met. And besides the, the T cells that do the jobs, there are also memory T cells, right? Yes, yes. So there's, of course, like with all parts of the immune system, there's like effector phase. So when like T cells like multiply, and these are the ones that you need at this moment. But then also um, the adaptive immune system is called adaptive because it can adapt to what you have seen, right? So it kind of can remember what you've seen before. And that's the one big part of the, of the adaptive mm-hmm. immune system that it can form memory and you can keep it around. And both of these cell types are different than the naive cells. Yes, yes. So the naive cell is like the repertoire that like all of us have. And then once you um, encounter anything like a virus, a bacteria, any antigen, um, then you form first effective cells and then memory cells. So these, um, so we also know there there are memory B cells, although we're not going to talk much about B cells. When you're infected, say with a virus, and then... B and T cells become activated. Are the kinetics similar or is one before the other? So um, so T cells and B cells meet in like the lymphoid organs and lymph nodes. Uh-huh. And that's when they tell each other like, oh, this is like around now. And then they activate, activate at the same time. <laughs> yeah. I like that. This is like around. <laughs> they, they meet in the hallway. and It's uh, like the, the huddle when you watch football, you know, like before you go, that's a lymph yeah. node. Yes. Yeah. So you like American football? I do well watching it. Yes, of course not playing. Yeah, watching, not playing. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because uh, people from Europe love soccer or football, whatever you want to call it. But they think that American football is just brutal, right? <laughs> Which well, it is. It, it is. Could be both. It is. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's not entertaining. Yeah, right. I mean, living in the U.S., I mean, why would I not watch football and baseball? Like, it's part of the part of the lifestyle. Yes, for me. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a good. That's a good way to look at it. You yeah. you you uh, adapt to where you are. I, I like that. Yeah. Okay, so um, so basically, the T and the B cells, their kinetics of activation are similar after you get infected. Infected, right? One is not preceding the other. So, in other words, when the B cell memory turns into effector cells, you make antibodies. At the same time, you're making cytotoxic T cells, right? Right, yeah. Okay. Now... And the... (laughs) the, the roles of the or the the dominance of these parts of the immune system vary from pathogen to pathogen, right? That's so some will be more of a killer T cell oriented, but some will be more of a antibody oriented response depending on what's infecting you. Yeah, absolutely. So it really depends on like what pathogen that you're encountering right now. So when I was uh, in grad school, I was taught that in general antibodies can prevent infection, but m- Mostly T cells resolve it because they kill infected cells. Is that still the prevailing idea? Yeah, if you think about it, because antibodies can recognize the entire virus particle, right? So, mm-hmm. But once the virus is inside the cell, the antibody cannot do nothing no more. So you need right. the T cells then to help you clear it. If the virus, if the antibody can neutralize the virus before it enters the cell, then that's good. You know, then, then that, this is taken care of. But once inside, you need T cells. Yeah, I, uh, I, I always learned it as um, cell-free versus cell-associated virus. Yes, I guess uh, some virus is always going to squeak through, right, and infect some cells. And so the T cells need to take care of that, yep. right? Yes, correct. Yeah. All right. So this is important because we're going to come back to this later. As we've already 
we've been talking about this whole idea a lot uh, during the pandemic. But first, um, yeah. So that was your immunology review for listeners, <laughs> in case yeah, you want to speed enough, on this because yeah. we're we're going to get deeper. Now, the, another thing we've heard a lot of. Uh, we talked a lot about on TWIV and it took people, it took the press a long time to pick up on this. What is a T cell epitope? <laughs> a T cell epitope is the very tiny, small part of a virus that a T cell recognizes. That's yet a big difference between T cells and antibodies. Antibodies can recognize 3D structures, like, you know, entire virus particles. T cells recognize small stretches of viruses. So, like nine amino acids for killer cells, around 15 mm -hmm. amino acids for like helper cells. A, a T cell does not recognize three, three dimensional epitopes, it's small stretches. And that's what an epitope is like the one part that is recognized by a T cell. Okay. And it can be in no. any protein, either on the inside or the outside of the virus. Can be in any protein because uh, um, everything is basically chopped up and like presented in small stretches uh, mm -hmm. of the virus. And ah, that's what so that's, T-cells recognize, yeah. That's what I was going to ask you. So when a virus infects the cells, all the proteins are chopped up and presented, right? But not all of them will be recognized by a T-cell, right? So, no, absolutely not. So it, there's um, different prerequisites that it's needed. So first, the virus needs to be chopped up. Then it needs to be presented. The T cells does not recognize free floating chopped up virus. So it needs to mm -hmm. be presented on the MHC molecule. And that's already the first, like, you know, um, gatekeeping, basically. Like if you if the part is not presented, it can never be an epitope. Okay. So and then now, the T cell recognizes like small parts of the virus, the epitopes that are presented on MHC. Yeah, I've always thought of this as sort of uh, the T cells go around and ask cells for their papers, and paper uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> the the cells put are always putting these these receptors on their surface that give a sample of what's going on in the cell, little pieces of protein. And if it's a normal self protein, the T cells, uh, okay, nothing to see here. But if it's a if it's something that has not been seen before, then there's a T cell that'll recognize that and say, whoa, 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 what do you think you're doing here? Right, right, right. yeah, yeah. Okay, so now one of the things you do a lot of is to identify these T cell epitopes, right? For you've done it for SARS-CoV-2, dengue, Zika, even uh, Shingrix vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that so, is Alex's work. Yes, yeah. Which I like because I just got my second dose last Friday, so it was fun to look at that. Um, There's nothing so fun how do about you... your second dose of Shingrix, though. It, was, it wasn't so bad. Oh, mine. Okay. Oh, I this was horrible. With it, yeah. Um, how do you identify a T-cell epitope? So it's basically, um, it always follows the same strategy. So you use, you need to know the, the sequence of the virus. That's the first mm -hmm. thing. So as soon as we knew the virus of SARS, the sequence of SARS-CoV-2, we could start um, going ahead and identifying epitopes. So you need to sequence, then you like make small peptides overlapping, right? So the entire virus sequence. And then you present that to cells, either ideally um, to, to people that have been exposed to the virus, because then you can easily like, probe the memory response. Or if you don't have anybody, then you can like, there are certain methods you can stimulate um, naive T cells and see if they have the potential to recognize a certain epitope. Mm -hmm. so, so these are, go ahead. I was gonna say, so one challenge to that is the fact that you might see different epitopes in different people. Uh, yes. And so how yeah. do you deal with that uh, issue that you don't have to deal with in the same way with antibodies? So if you look at T-cell epitopes and you look at overlapping protein peptides, then you don't need to know the, the different um, HLA phenotypes. So that's one thing maybe I should have mentioned. So the, the molecules that present the T-cell epitope, the MHC molecules, are different in every person. It's like a fingerprint, different in you, me, and everybody um, around us. So... What we usually do is we HLA um, type these people so that we can at least infer. So we know, okay, a person that has like AO201, for example, recognizes this particular epitope. That's, of course, the inf you infer that, but like that's your first hint. And then you just like keep accumulating like this whole like matrix of like, you know, epitopes that are recognized and you can match it with like the phenotype in people that it was recognized. So that's how you slowly put together the pieces of the puzzle. So the um, you need to take you need to have lymphocytes from people. To yes, do this, you need right? to have yes, yes. And so they have to be alive. So you take blood and you purify the lymphocytes and you put them in a culture. Then you take your peptides 
that a company has made for you, I guess, right? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, and again, these are covering all the viral proteins. And how long are the peptides, eight or nine amino acids? So typically we start with 15 mers because then okay. um, um, MHC class one, so CD8 and uh, CD4 T cells can recognize them, have the chance to recognize them. Of okay. course, once you identify an epitope, you need to can do work like to define the ideal, the optimal epitope. And then, you know, you get, show it different like versions like 8 mers, 9 mers, 10 mers, 11 mers to see which one is the ideal one. But mm -hmm. if you just start the screening, 15 mers is usually what we start using. Yes. So, and what you do is you have thousands of peptides, right, that you put on cells. Is that, yes. is that correct? And so how do you eventually say which peptide is binding? So what we typically do is like, so let's say we have like a thousand peptides, then we make smaller pools of like, you know, 10 to 15 oh, okay. peptides in a pool. And then we see which one like turns out positive and then we deconvolute. Then we test mm -hmm. the positive pools for all the individual peptides. And then we find out which one is the one that is responsible um, for the response. I don't know how you t have time to go s surfing with all that. That's a lot of work. <laughs> That's a lot. Of, okay, so eventually you can identify individual peptides that... All right, the other question is, how do you know when a peptide is recognized by a T cell? Yeah, there's different ways we can use to read out the response. So one uh, very um, uh, general one that a lot of laboratories use is like ALISPOP. So basically... A peptide that induces a, a response, induces um, interferon gamma, and then you can measure that. And then you can okay. do it in a 96 well format. You can read out a lot of these different um, reactions. What we have been mostly using also for COVID uh, research is uh, uh, fluorescent flow cytometry. So that mm -hmm. we have like, you know, uh, a more better idea of like what is the exact subset that's recognized because you can see if it's like a CD8 TSA response or CD4 TSA response. And this was the readout based on like um, upper collision of the activation markers, the AIM assay, which has been developed by Shane's lab. So you basically can see which cell recognizes an epitope because it activates Okay. some of these receptors and that you can measure. So, so basically so, you're looking for proteins on the surface of the cell that are um, indicative of that cell being an effector or a memory cell as opposed to a naive cell. Exactly, yes, yeah. Now, if you do this for SARS-CoV-2, um, where are the T-cell epitopes located? <laughs> well, so um, <laughs> all over, really. So, so mm -hmm. we, in the beginning, our very first study was to ask exactly that question, because by the time we started working on that, uh, there were already vaccines being developed, um, mm. you know, using the spike protein. So um, we were like, we just really wanted to make sure that this is actually what is recognized by T cells, because what if you make a vaccine you know, with a spike protein and then T cells recognize every, anything else? But in this case, good news, spike was highly recognized, but also so were other proteins. And that, I think, mm -hmm. is um, important for now when all these different variants coming up right now, because like because a T cell needs to like really like have mutations in a lot of different epitopes to like completely abolish the T cell response. And that mm -hmm. hasn't happened so far. So every other viral protein has uh, T cell epitopes or are there certain ones that have most of them? So there's, of course, the structural ones, um, uh, spike, uh, nuclear capsid, membrane. Right. Do you have a lot of epitopes? But then also okay. non-structural proteins have T-cell epitopes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, roughly how many T-cell epitopes are we talking about in the whole genome? Well, so if you want to do like an, an average number, so about um, every of us recognize around 15 to 20 epitopes. And of course, they are different in everybody because all of us have a different HLA phenotype. So on average, 15 to 20 is what each one of us recognizes. Ah, each one of us recognizes 15 to 20 epitopes on a variety of viral spike and nucleocapsid and some others, right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Well, now, if huh. you so if huh. you got vaccinated, <clears throat> you would have um, T cell epitopes on spike that mm -hmm. would be recognized, presumably. Yes. But if you have never been infected you wouldn't have T, cell, T cells responding to internal proteins yet, would you? If you have never been infected, no. You would uh, recognize spike protein that's right. induced by the vaccine, yes. And there's plenty of epitopes also on the yeah. spike protein, so yeah. Not your whole 15 to 20, but still a good number. Right. Yeah, still a good number, yeah. And not necessarily in the same places as the antibody epitopes. 
No, because uh, because antibodies are more like you know like four dimensional or like three D structures, and that these are linear epitopes, linear epitopes that are recognized. Yeah. Right. So yeah, even so if we're just even if we're just talking about vaccine response, the T cell repertoire is a um, kind of a superset or a, a broader view than a few mutations that might come out in a variant. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So all of us recognize, so even if it's not 15 to 20 over the entire virus proteome, it's still like a bunch of epitopes. And then the other thing that we need to keep in mind is because all of us recognize different epitopes. So let's say I'm the unlucky one and I, uh, I'm infected with a variant where all my T cell epitopes are muted. That doesn't mean like you have the same, you have the same, or you have the same. Mm. So in this case, like, you know, like the population um, is protected differently, even though in me as an individual, maybe uh, might, if I'm the unlucky one and have all of the mutations. Um, yeah, that's in yeah. contrast to yeah. antibody escape, where if it happens in you, it can infect someone else because the antibodies are more or less the same. Exactly. Yeah. So that's different. So, yeah, I always say yeah. like there's uh, the, the immune system has like, you know, antibodies and T cells for a reason. It's like, you know, it's not, it's not like yeah. one and other strategy, things, yeah. As we've learned other things like FC mediated functions too that don't depend on neutralization, right? Yes, correct, yeah. Now, early in, the, in, in 2020, in October, you published a paper which made a lot of news. <laughs> you were the last author there um, showing people who had never been infected with SARS-CoV-2 nevertheless could, had T cells that would recognize... Um, some, some epitopes, right? So where did they come from and, and are they protective in any way? Yes. So that's exactly um, the questions that we were like following. So we early on recognized um, that people that have never seen the virus and why we know they have never seen the virus because they are in our liquid nitrogen tanks from 2015 to 2017 So <laughs> we took these cells out as a control. The basically. people are not actually in your liquid nitrogen tanks. But <laughs> the cells from, from the, the people, yes. yes. <laughs> Just, I wanted to clarify Let that for any check. listeners. Yes. <laughs> yes, cells from, from people that have been uh, bled in 2015 to 2018. And so the cells from these people recognize all of a sudden these virus they have never seen. And, uh, and not just like one or two, 50% of the people. And we were like, huh, this is mm. what is going on here. So, so we uh, followed up on that. And of course the first uh, common um, assumption was, okay, must be closely related viruses. Um, so we mapped against uh, common cold viruses, which are commonly like circulating in the population. And we actually could map some of these epitopes to common cold mm. viruses. And so that's when we said like, oh, this must be coming from, um, from exposure to any of these, because all of us are exposed since we're a couple of years old to any of these viruses. Mm. So that didn't ask the question, answer the question like, is that good or bad? Is it good to have this uh, pre-existing immunity or is it bad for you? Or maybe it doesn't matter at all. So that was a question much more difficult to answer because to, to know that you need to like have samples of blood samples from people before they've been infected and compared to a response after and know the outcome they've been infected. Mm. So that is uh, difficult to do. So what we did, we actually used a vaccine cohort where we have like um, samples from before they got the vaccine and asked if the response to the vaccine was different, if they had this pre-existing memory before or not. And I told you, it's not like a rare occurrence. We saw that in about half of the people. So mm. also in our vaccine cohort, 50% of the people that received the vaccine had pre-existing T cells. And these are um, always CD4 T cells. So we, we, never, we didn't see a lot of CD8 T cell response that was cross-reactive. So when we compared the 50% that had this pre-existing T cell response versus the ones that had not, we saw that the kinetics were faster response to the vaccine. So we saw like stronger and faster um, CD4 T cell response induced after vaccination. And that also resulted in faster kinetics for antibody responses. And six months after vaccination, we saw that they had like higher neutralizing titers against if they had before vaccination pre-existing memory. So that was the first uh, um, hint that they actually might have a, a protective role because like, do you definitely have a faster um, response against the vaccine? Were the responses similar with all four of the common cold coronaviruses or were some uh, giving you different pre-existing immunity than others? 
so it this it was impossible to like parse up because like it's difficult to see which one is actually um, because because all of us have been exposed to all of these common cold viruses, right? So it's difficult to like, actually like you look at antibody responses and see like, oh, this person has only been exposed to HQ1 or NS63 and then map it. So, so in my data could not tell this apart, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. I would wonder, it, it could also be cool and I don't know how your data could tell this, but it would be interesting to know if things like how long ago you were infected or something like that matters, um, but that would be like impossible to figure out. <laughs> Uh, we would need to go to all like to pediatric samples because like children yeah. by three years old, they are already exposed to many of these common mm. cold viruses. So, yeah. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, definitely so, an interesting question. So with with 50 percent of people having these cross reactive responses, can you figure out if they do any differently if they're infected in terms of disease? So there is, I think Shane has been running a study um, looking at exactly that, but you need to collect samples from a lot of people and then wait until they get infected and then collect right. like the common cold, the, the disease history. So yeah, so and that's, that's the a, way you would do it, yeah. So we don't have an answer to that question to this day, right? I don't, yeah. Okay. Well, and I assume vaccination history would also complicate that because you've got hopefully people mostly vaccinated who then get infected and then they've got this whole immune history built yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, right now it's like a really like, it's not like it used to be like in 2020 when people were only infected or only vaccinated. Now everybody is like, you know, like infected, vaccinated, has a breakthrough infection, had like an infection before, then got vaccinated. So it's like, it's very different right now. And they might not necessarily even know what order any of these things happened in. Exactly, yes, yeah. Exactly. And, and so when you are measuring these cross-reactive responses, you're using the AIM assay. So basically, you, you, there could be some cells who maybe didn't respond in the assay or something like that. That 50% um, may not get at every single T cell that could have ever been in, uh, activated in the whole person's life. Yes. So what, when we used to map these, we actually did not use the AIM assay. We actually looked into like... Um, um, we pre presented them single peptides okay. and asked if they now recognize the corresponding peptides from the common cold viruses. And then we could see yes or no. Yeah. So, of course, that is possible that there is other um, epitopes too. And then also like, um, um, which is in the supplemental figure, there is epitopes that uh, uh, do not map the common cold viruses. So we don't know what, what, <laughs> where they are from or what, what this hmm. is and use this, yeah. And so by the way, this is not like a phenomenon just seen for like uh, SARS-CoV-2. We've seen the same for, in my life before COVID, I was studying like dengue virus. There's dengue and Zika are closely related. There's epitopes that overlap. So you can have responses against Zika even though you have never seen it because you have been exposed to dengue before. So I think this is not an isolated phenomenon, but it is something that hasn't been looked um, comprehensively in, the, in human populations because like if you do mouse studies, you know what your mouse has been infected with, right? One virus, you know the dose, you know the time. So human populations, it's a history of our infections. Yeah. And we don't know yet and everything that influences each other. So that's that's one question I'm very interested in in my lab. So, so yeah, of course, it's not going to be a simple answer, I think. So the other, the other topic I wanted to touch on is as... as as the virus has been spreading, we have these variants of concern emerging, and each time you guys look at the T cell epitopes to see <laughs> to see if they're changing. So, from the original virus all the way through the Omicron variants, tell us about what's been going on with uh, T cell epitopes. Yeah, so this is really um, mostly like lab work that is done in Alex Setter's lab, and uh, they are doing exactly this question, like, do we ever encounter a variant that can completely evade T cell response? And, and for the reasons we have been discussing before, it's not that easy because everybody recognizes a lot of different epitopes and everybody recognizes um, um, multiple different um, mm -hmm. um, t uh, t epitopes. So... Um, what they have been doing, Alex, uh, uh, Alex Group, they have actually then mapped all of these epitope responses and actually replaced every variant. If a variant had a mutation in a certain epitope, they made this peptide and tested this. And so far, they have not seen any epitope 
any variant that uh, has completely like changed the teaser response. So it's been pretty mm. conserved, the teaser response so far. And, and so through... Isn't that kind of true of a lot of viruses? Are there many viruses that could completely evade a T-cell response? <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, for this particular reason, because like, you know, like even if you're unlucky and in you, everybody of us has many epitopes against all different viruses. But then like it's so different in a population level so that, yes, there's not a virus that can invade teaser response in everybody. Yes. I mean, there's certainly late, uh, chronic infections, right? Like hep C and HIV, yes. where in one person it... it you get you get uh, T cell epitopes changed because in that person it would make a difference. Right? Yes, 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 yes. But uh, not in a population yeah. level, right? Yeah. If those transmit, Correct. then yeah. they're not any better in another person. Right. 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 Okay, so even through the most recent Omicron subvariants, we still have intact uh, T cell epitopes. Yes. And so many people have suggested that that's why the original vaccines still work, right? Because the T cell response is, is still intact, correct? Do you think that makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, and as, as, as I said, like, so, so a T cell cannot induce sterile immunity because by definition, mm -hmm. you already are infected, that a right. T cell gets kicked off. But a T cell can like recognize infected cells and then respond against it and that's what what people think and i think so too that that um makes a difference in your disease severity so it's not in it's not preventing infection but helps you like uh, not getting severely sick so what would what what about the t-cell response would make let's make it easy somebody over <laughs> 75 have a more severe disease versus a young person yeah, that, so that's an interesting question, and uh, and one of my first hypotheses was like, oh, if these cross-reactive T cell responses are induced by common cold viruses, so maybe old people have less of this. And mm -hmm. uh, I looked at this, and this is not the case. It doesn't matter if you're like 20 or 80; you still have the same level of pre-existing T cell responses. So that mm -hmm. was not the answer. Um, so there's a lot of things that happen during aging with a T cell response. So we know, and that's not only for COVID, that's also for like, you know, CMV, chronic infection viruses. Um, if you get older, like you accumulate like um, T cell responses, if you're constantly exposed to something. And also that can change like how um, readily they can respond. So I think that has not been like entirely looked into in the context of COVID, if that is, if the T cell response, because like the older you are, um, if you have a naive T cell response, it needs to be kicked off. That's different because naive T cells, your pool shrinks when you get older, right? Mm. So that's one thing that, like, you know, like the older you are, um, the more you see novel pathogens, the more difficult it is to find um, response. But so that's the simple answer. But of course, it's a lot more complicated. So, so, we don't so know the naivete yet. of youth is partially protective. <laughs> it's beautifully put yes um would a naive cell from a younger person and an older person um react similarly or are um, there are other ways in which the aged immune system is a little bit different yeah so that's a good question and that's actually something that i was studying during my phd so is a naive cell is always a naive cell because like it's always like you know you use a certain set of markers and you can look at the same set in young people and older people and even if you look at the same markers which which we define as naive cells they might be different in older people so they have less functionality even though that we would could still them uh, call a naive t cells so it's that's why it's, it's not it's it's different when you age even though it's still a naive T cells, it might be affected. So this is in part why, maybe why vaccine um, protection is not is not adequate among older elderly elderly people. Is that correct? I mean, that could be part of the reason. I think it's different for every vaccine. So you need to, uh, yeah. and every virus you're infected, there's not a one fits all answer to that. Yeah, but it's certainly like. Um, a field that is like super interesting and and get and, and a lot of people working on it right now because what is with the aging of the immune system and T cells out of all parts of the immune system age the fastest. Mm -hmm. 
Does this, um, so have people looked at this with flu and flu vaccination? Because that's something before the pandemic that we talked about a lot with um, older people having less response to flu vaccines, and that led to the development of the high-dose flu vaccines and so on. And just this notion that the older immune system is less responsive. And I assume that the T-cell response is a big part of that. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly. So this has been um, done a lot in the flu field because of that specific reason. And like cytomegalovirus is also like something that is like strongly studied when you like look at aging immune system because you accumulate T cells against a certain pathogen, in this case, chronic um, or latent infected pathogen um, during age, because you carry this around your entire life. Right. So you, your T cells constantly see something that does something to them. Yeah, what was the statistic Felicia gave us that when you get to be uh, really advanced in age, like a third of your immune response is against CMV or something yeah. like that? And yes. There's, I don't know if you said... Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, there's certainly like people that have like 20% of CD8T's responses against one certain CMV app. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's amazing. It's really remarkable. So is there um, a difference in the TSO... I don't know what to call it, T-cell response, let's say, uh, comparing vaccinated with infected people? In terms of uh, the epitopes or in terms of like the magnitude? Yeah, so the epitope it's response, no, it's it's similar. Yeah. It's the same, okay. Yeah. And is there any difference? Like, Because I, I, I'm not asking the question right to try and get a good answer, but is there a difference between vaccinating and being infected in any aspect of the T-cell response? No, everything that we looked at, there was no difference. But a minus, like, of course, you only have spike-specific T-cell responses. Yeah, right. so yes. that's the yes. big difference, yeah. But the functionality, so the magnitude, those are the same? Yes. Is it better in terms of disease protection to have T-cells directed against proteins other than spike? Does it make a difference? Do we know? Well, that's a question that uh, is actually looked into uh, right now. Like, you know, like the people that have a BRICS or infection when they get vaccinated and they get infected, mm-hmm. is that different uh, yeah. than if they don't have it? So like, I don't think there has been a um, um, a consensus on this answering this question uh, right of yet. Because that's exactly like something um, that is very interesting. And then the other thing is like we mm. know people get infected and people next to them get exposed, but do not never get infected themselves. So what's different mm-hmm. in them, right? So I think there's a lot of different um, uh, questions that um, that are like being looked at right now. Um, so one of the um, papers that Vincent had mentioned um, that you're on um, really fascinated me sort of on this point. Um, this is a, um, the one on the impact of exposure history on the T cell and antibody response. Um, and um, I'd never seen data like the data in that paper about multiple exposures um, kind of stay, giving you sort of a plateaued level of T-cell responses. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and whether that surprised you? I mean, that's something that um, that is right now in everybody's on everybody's mind because, like, the question is, like, how many boosters are enough, right? And this is exactly like um, asking the question. We all got like one dose, two dose. Many of us got a booster. Many of us got another booster. So do we need like a, like a booster every year? Does it make a difference? Or do we reach this plateau at one point for T cells? Antibodies mm-hmm. might be a different story. And then it exactly ask the question about hybrid immunity. Is there a difference there? Maybe you, you know you don't need hybrid immunity is what we call when you're vaccinated and infected people. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think we now are in a unique position that we actually can study that because we know so well about like the exposure history during this pandemic, because it's something that is just um, closely like monitored. But I think that really like um, going forward, I think will help answer a lot of these uh, different uh, uh, questions. Yeah. So we don't have an answer to whether hybrid immunity is better for T cells or not. Well, inducing the T-cell response, I don't don't think there is a lot of difference. But then if this is like completely true in preventing disease, then that, uh, yeah. So there there is um, a lot of discussion about uh, B-cell imprinting, right? Where 
you you tend to make a response to the original antigen. Is, does the same thing happen with T cells? I mean, that has been like really a big question in the, in the field that I usually study, like dengue virus. Mm -hmm. You get infected with one um, dengue virus serotype. You're imprinted by it. Does it make a difference if you then see another um, a serotype mm -hmm. and another serotype? And uh, and I think this goes back to when we really think about like that. It's not we, nobody of us gets induced one epitope and then that changes. So you, because you always have a broad um, response that you get a, that you respond to with even if you have like um, certain imprinting with one um, epitope or one serotype then mm -hmm. it could not it doesn't necessarily like mean that like your response to the second serotype in this case um, is imprinted and it's actually interesting in the field of dengue like whatever what it turned out to be like so the more virus dengue virus you see the more serotypes the more of conserved the proteins it is mm -hmm. like you contracted the immune response. So, so if you, um, I don't know if you've looked at this or if anyone has, you take people who've been vaccinated with the ancestral vaccine, then you give them a bivalent booster where we have an Omicron BA4-5. Does that, have, have you looked at the T cell response and does it make any difference? And what are the epitopes? So are, we are looking are... at this exact question right now because we do okay. have the cohorts where people get infected or boosted um, for the first time with ancestral strain. And then we have a cohort where the, the force boost, the force exposure is the bivalent. So is that a difference? Yeah. So we have we uh, have been collecting this right now. So I'll see. Yeah. Cool. My, uh, which... my hypothesis would be it doesn't make a big difference because otherwise we would have seen any of these variants come up with a completely different teaser response. But yes. Of course, we need to um, show that. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's really the question, right? Because yeah, it, certainly the um, isn't it the case that the bivalent booster mainly increases the ancestral antibodies, right, against the ancestral strain? There's very little increase against the the BA four five itself, right, which is the imprinting part. So, right, yeah, and um, of course that will that will give you protection against uh, severe disease for couple of months, I guess, or mild disease, but as soon as the antibody levels go down, then you seem to be in the same place that you were when you started, right? Yeah. Well, not necessarily, I mean, not the same place you were when you were unvaccinated completely, yes, yes, but the no, same no, place no, you no, were just after, before. The, after the third dose. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the question is, is three or maybe four doses of ancestral sufficient? And are you really going to get much of a benefit from a booster and should you be doing that every year or every six months? That's, I think, an important question. Right? And does it yeah. matter if that booster is designed differently or can you just keep giving the same booster every time? Right, right. Yeah, uh, that's exactly the question that is on, on everybody's mind and also on our mind right now. Yeah. Do, do you have an idea about the answer? <laughs> no? No. Um, did, you, did, did you get a bivalent booster? I did, yes. In November. Okay. Go ahead, Brianne. Sorry. Um, so you also um, were looking a little bit at um, the NVX um, vaccine, um, the protein vaccine compared to RNA vaccines. Um, so Alan mentioned, you know, does it matter if you get different types of vaccines thinking about the sequence? Um, but what about different types of vaccine modality versus protein or inactivated or mRNA vaccine? Yeah, so absolutely. So that was like a study that um, we have been asking this exact question because is there a difference in people that got like any of the mRNA vaccines or like the adenovirus vaccines or the protein vaccines, right? Because because like you all have been see, presented the same antigen. Is there a difference in the, how our Im immune system like recognizes it? And it's interesting because they certainly induce um, different kinetics in the immune response, right? So for the mRNA vaccines, we see a, like a fast induction, and then um, the, they peak two weeks after the second dose. Um, adenovirus vaccine, we looked at, um, like gets one shot, right? But we still see a much lower level, but we still see like six months out um, teaser response against that. The, the magnitude, of course, is much lower than like what we've seen with the um, mRNA vaccines. And then, of course, the protein vaccine was another question. And we actually saw that the level of CD4 T responses induced by the protein vaccine compared to mRNA vaccines is uh, very comparable. Did you look at inactivated at all? 
No, I have not uh, looked at inactivated. So we have been looking at the vaccines that have been like administered here in Southern California, which were like basically these four. Yeah. And I think the important thing is like that you want to like look at this in the same population at the same time, you know, like and take a lot of like these variables out so that you have. It's not that like, oh, these have been processed in this lab or this, you know, that's why they, yeah. we could see the difference. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think that that's so interesting because, you know, uh, people have sometimes thought of some of these as being more antibody vaccines or T-cell directed vaccines. Um, and I'm really fascinated about the data that shows, you know, that protein-based vaccine giving you such a nice CD4 response. Um, I'm not sure that that would have been what I expected. And so I think that this is yeah, a really so interesting no. data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, same here. So uh, th that was like the big question, like does a protein vaccine in use like CD4 T's responses? And it, this one does, yes, yeah. Did you and to the same level, yeah. Did it induce CD8 responses? No, the protein vaccine did not induce a lot of CD8 T's responses. But the right. mRNA did. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, no, yeah. On a much lower level than CD4 responses, but yes, we saw, yeah, CD8 responses. So the, what do the influenza vaccines do? They're disrupted particles, mainly protein, right? So they do induce CD8 responses. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you if you knew whether, um, let's say you took, let's. Let's say you took someone who's not vaccinated and they got infected uh, and then they were treated with a monoclonal or a Paxlovid or whatever. Would that limit the, um, the maturation of the T-cell response, do you think? So that is like a study that like Shane's group has just uh, been published. So they asked this exact question, like is a T cell right. response affected in people that do get like monocl monoclonal antibody mm -hmm. therapy? And the answer is no. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. So, I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was uh, that's uh, Shane's group's work. They have been just showing that. So enough reproduction occurs that you can get sufficient T cell responses, right? It looks like it, yeah. It's and almost it's just, as if the immune system is really durable against perturbations of various kinds. Yeah. <laughs> Good for us. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that does sort of fit with the data that you had where um, the three doses didn't change the T cell response. It's sort of like the, the, mm. the magnitude or the, the dose didn't influence the T cell response in the same way that it influenced the B cell responses. So I guess in that way, mm. those two findings go together. Yes. Okay, so then... The same experiment for antibodies is is different, right? Yes. So if you if you get an antiviral, then you're not going to have as as broad an antibody response as you would if you let the infection go. Correct. That's what I would think. So yes, yeah. yeah. As as I said, uh, this is not my <laughs> expertise. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is not a reason not to get the antiviral, particularly if you're high risk and infected. Just to be yes, clear. Yes. 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 Sure. 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 And um, the other the other question that comes up a lot is um, so I, I think I remember that after SARS one they could find um, they could find memory T cells in people for seventeen years is that correct? That is correct. Yes, <laughs> they have been looking at this and they saw like T cell respo memory responses seventeen yeah. years later. Yeah, that's another puzzling question about how is this memory T cell memory like you know form. Because it's not the same in everybody. It's not the same for every, like, you know, um, virus. Sure. Yeah. So, but so, so yeah. COVID-2 could be different from COVID-1, basically, right? Could be. But so far, I mean, so I think the reason uh, Spike was chosen as, like, a vaccine target was because of SARS-1, like an educated mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is the that length of um, persistence of 17 years, does that seem um, like... An outlier is high or low, or does that seem kind of what we might see for many viruses? No, so that's a, a very interesting question. Also, somewhat I am personally interested in. So, because we have people that received the yellow fever vaccine, and also 10 years later, we see still responses against the same epitope in the same people. But then there's some people that, like, three months after vaccination, you can't detect these responses. So, I'm interested in finding out, like, what's different in the people that do have this long-lasting teaser memory and people that do not. So it's it's not only different based on the virus, it's also different based on uh, everybody, mm. uh, all the different um, 
people. So, yeah, I don't think because it would be really nice if we would know after vaccination, like you're going to be fine and you're not going to be fine. You're going to booster, <laughs> but we're not there yet. Yeah. So what would we need to make that statement? What kind of information? <laughs> <laughs> so first of all you would need to like look like look at like you know biomarkers that tell you like yeah. hey you are the one that like does not need to worry and you're the one that should maybe come back in six months and get another booster or something but there we have there's no idea we don't know i mean for many of these viral diseases we don't know correlates of protection you know of course yeah, yeah. so so that's a whole next step to like not even like you know getting an and the correlative protection, but also like, you know, a personalized indicator of like, you should sure. maybe like watching you not. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, even if you did know a correlate, it doesn't mean it's going to work in everybody. Exactly. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So you let mean, alone. Right. You'd have to, you'd have to drill all the way down to what is your exact HLA type and what do we know about the correlation of that HLA type with the particular immune response and then you'd have to have robust enough data that that prediction was actually valid for some good range it, of, of outcomes. And, and then you really have to like believe that this is singularity, right? So that it's like the HLA only that tells you yeah. this. Because there's right, people right, yeah. that maybe have crappy T-cell response, but maybe they have really good antibody response. They're not so dependent on a T-cell response. Maybe there's people yeah. that don't have very good antibody response, but really good T-cells, so they're fine too. So I think it's a perfect storm when you like don't have one thing, and don't have the other one, and then... And so that's why it makes it even more complicated. So I think it's really like a picture of like multiple like moving parts. Yeah, well, based on hist some of history your... of previous exposures. That was exactly what I was going to say. Based on right. your other paper, your infection history would probably yes. be needed too. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, as you say, it may not just be HLA. It could be many other things. Yeah. In fact, I would look at everything. Yes, a know. combination of. Yes, absolutely. Yes. That's why I'm... I think this was like such a good lesson in like when we like looked at the uh, all arms of the immune system against like one certain thing because typically like we look at T cells that's it other labs look at antibodies that's it so this was this for the first time um that we looked at everything at the same adaptive immune response mm -hmm. we have still ignored mm -hmm. the innate immune response against mm -hmm. that but yeah so i think that's important and i think that's we we something we would need to do going forward for a lot of different uh, uh vaccines and and uh, in diseases the, the problem is that, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, people want answers. And yes. They try and oversimplify, right? That has been our issue <laughs> from the beginning, because like when this pre-existing paper was published, people were like, yeah, half of us are good. <laughs> 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 and we were no, 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 that's not what we said. So, no, yes, the mortality yes, statistics yeah. clearly, clearly did not back yes, that up. Yes, yes, yes. But that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, so people... People want answers, and I understand that because, like, everybody wants to know, like, what's next and forth. But, like, you know, we it it doesn't work that way. We have to like collect data and, like, you know, and then kind of answer maybe a small part of it, not never like the entire like thing. Yeah. No, in a pandemic, things are different, right? And then they, if you talk to enough people, you will find someone who will say, "Yeah, that means we're protect. Half of us are protected, and that's what propagates through the media and." Even though you guys over there are pulling your hair out when you hear this, someone else has said it and it's propagated. And that's not just for that, but many other observations as well, right? It's, it's really difficult. And we've been struggling with that here on this program to try and figure out uh, how to deal with it. Yeah. It seems that it. Go ahead. One Sorry. thing that I learned. Uh, our, I me mean, and many of us learn in a pandemic is like, you know, like it's really important how you communicate. And then you communicate. And that's something that, I mean, when I was in grad school, like the more complicated you would say about and talk about something, the more smarter you thought you are. Mm -hmm. When really the reality is like <laughs> if people, all everybody understands what you're saying, then you did it the right way. So that's something certainly like in a pandemic that we all notice that like it's so important. That's why I think what you guys are doing like is, is has always been such a big like, you know, public service. The problem is we don't always give you a straightforward <laughs> answer, right? right? That's part of science, yes. It is science. Yeah. We will say, well, there's, we don't know, and, and people don't like that. They will go somewhere to find someone who says an answer, right, instead of we're not sure about the outcome. And so we always will present a study and say, 
Well, we don't know what this means, but here it is. And, and uh, so people will find people who say what it means and, and they get a lot of attention. So it's kind of frustrating. But, yeah. I mean, the Internet is a place I can find the tr everything I want to hear. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> And if you have a particular idea, you can find it validated on the internet. It abounds right? with simple wrong answers, yes. It yes. abounds with simple wrong answers. So basically what you – and this – we started this about memory. Um, you, you, we don't know how long memory to SARS-CoV-2 is. Certainly not T-cell memory. We have no idea, right? No, and that's just also like a function of like, the, you know, we are in year, what, year four now? So, yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> so we don't know if 10 years from now we will still see memories. So that's something. I mean, we were excited that we, uh, one of our first publications was like about memory was like, okay, six months, you know, 90% mm. of us still have it, you know, six to eight months afterwards. But that was because at that time we could measure it that far because we don't have people we can bleed five years after infection. So, yeah. that's, so, what, that's kind so of right now you have three years-ish, right? Yeah. Do you still, in, in what fraction of people do you see T-cell memory still? So right now this answer is also not is also not easy to answer because people have not been exposed once and then like, you know, like being mm. clear... For, so we don't know because they could have been exposed multiple times, which we don't know. They, they are certainly, most of us are vaccinated multiple times. So it's it's not an easy thing to answer on a population basis because it's just such a, such a like, you know, a, 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 like a, co a cohort that has just been exposed multiple times with multiple different uh, vaccines and infections. Right. And, continue, and bold right? prediction here going yeah. way out on a limb. Yeah. And 10 years from now, people will still be exposed to this virus and you will still not know if this was memory from their vaccination 10 years prior or if this is because they just caught it from ah, their kid a, a month yes. earlier. Yeah, correct. Very yeah. Good point. You need an island population where nobody comes and goes. Where nobody has ever gotten SARS-CoV-2. Go in and vaccinate everybody and then just don't let well, anybody leave. You know, the... Um, what is what are those islands to the north of the UK uh, where they did the measles Faroe, study, the Faroe right? Islands. The, Faroe the Faroe Islands. islands Nobody right. went. W yeah. There was a ship that went once a year to the island, yeah. right? So they could do that kind of study right. and see how long memory lasts to measles, and it lasts forty years. Wow. Yeah. Well, I know that there's a study that <laughs> is a little bit controversial where they've tried to look at this um, with smallpox vaccine because they know people couldn't have been infected afterwards, but you know. That you're also looking at people who are the elderly, elderly in some cases. So that's a whole. Yeah, you you yeah. need to be able to wait and look for a large number of years without someone getting old. Yeah, <laughs> we don't need that aging complication. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you need yeah. to take. You need to take a, a spaceship full of people <laughs> and accelerate them to near the speed of light. To no. Yeah. That's... So we. All right, that's really important. Yeah, we 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 can't really determine the, the length of time we're going to have memory. But what we can do is say from year to year, um, do people get sick? Right? Everyone's now either infected or vaccinated, and the virus continues to change antigenically. So what happens to the overall disease, right? So now we have in the U.S. 500 people a day dying, right? Does that change over time? which would imply some kind of durable memory. And even right. if it's people getting infected every year, that's fine, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's what we do with the other, that's what the, we do with the other four coronaviruses. They've been their own vaccines, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. What were we going to say, Daniela? Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to like, basically like, um, say that what you're saying is like, I agree with it. So we will need to see, you know, like, and then uh, infection, is not something that a vaccine will prevent, but like, you know, disease. So that's as long as people like epidemiologists like going to keep these numbers, we can maybe look then into like a subset and see like, how does this correlate with like the population immunity? Yeah. 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 You know, in, in just a final thought, I mean, it seems to me that this idea of making a variant specific booster, making it frequently is trying to prevent infection, but you know, here on TWIV, we worry about that because that's not really a, a viable public health strategy, right? Yeah, I think, I think, and that's what we're going back to, like, you know, like how things are communicated. I mean, mm. th there's not a lot of vaccines that provide sterile immunity. Yeah. 
So that's uh, something that is like not just like the case for like you know, the COVID vaccines. Yeah. So I, I think it, that the, the difference between infection and like you know protection against disease needs to be more clearly communicated. That people have a yeah. different um, expectation. Yeah. So that's well, tough for us. <laughs> yeah. I think that also uh, is where antivirals come in. Where yeah. if, if you have at risk people, you treat them because if the vaccine doesn't prevent infection then they could get a severe infection and so you treat them you'd be ready with a plan we don't do that very effectively these 500 people who are dying every day less than one percent of them are getting paxlovid right and they should that would probably save their lives so there, there are other approaches and how, it was very good to hear that that treatment wouldn't blunt the immune response that's really good to know so, so daniela in this case, yeah in this, in this case, case right. yeah uh, is there anything that we should have covered that we didn't? No, I think that was, uh, you know, a pretty good summary of my life the last three years. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> what do you think? All of our lives. What do you think is sort of the biggest interesting question about T cells that uh, the field needs to answer? In terms of uh, COVID specific? In terms or, of whatever you'd the- like. Well, my biggest questions, and that is like biased to my interest, is of course like how long do we have memory, mm-hmm. and what's different in people that like are able to mount a good immune resp- a T cell response and people that are not, you know, because like everybody is able to mount a good T cell response against certain vaccines, but like not memory. So that is something I'm interested. In. And then we have touched on it multiple times: infection history. How does that influence each other? Mm. Because we are not an island. And we are all of us have a different infection history and we all age. So like at what point? And I mean, I'm not saying that is an an easy question, but like that's what I'm personally interested in a lot. Yeah. So you can't really use animals, non-human animal models, because you don't know how they mimic humans in terms of memory, right? Yes, correct. And and also like because it's just... um, um, it's just a different question because like not everybody gets infected at the same time. It's the same thing. And so I yeah. think, I do think animal models are really interesting if you have a very specific question where like you want to know like what is the exact sequence of the virus that have been infected and f- two days, mm-hmm. two weeks, two months, two years later, you look maybe not two years, but like you look at this and ask that question. Yeah. So I think there's a place for that. But uh, if you look into some population based studies, I think you need to, um, study humans. Yeah. I mean, with animals, you could, first of all, you can't go, man, you can't go 20 years in an animal. No, Nobody's going to even, even two years. So I was like, Nobody's yeah. two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's going to pay for that study. If you write exactly. a grant to do a 20 year study, what are you out of your mind? Yeah, so yeah, you yeah. do a two and you say, ah, oh, there's durable T cell memory after two years. What does it mean? Right. It, it I don't know if you know what it means for people, but it's only two years, right? <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, in a mouse, two years is elderly, elderly, but that yes. doesn't necessarily translate to yeah. humans. No, I think these are this is a good conversation. It makes people understand how hard it is to get concrete answers on just about everything you'd want to know. <laughs> That's correct. Yes. Uh, about uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID, and Im- immunity. So. Thank you very much for uh, for helping us, Daniela Weisskopf from the La Jolla Institute for Immunology. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited. <laughs> thank you. Thank, great. thank you. This when is you so get, fun. We'll get you back when you have your next round of uh, cool results. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank right. you. Yep. Bye bye. Bye. I don't know how you communicate some of these things, right? It's really the, they're really challenging difficult. and it makes it very clear that immunity or having an immune response is not one thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think she was, she was really good. Just that, oh yeah. <laughs> that really um, yeah. covered, covered a lot of uh, really important points, I think. But uh, I think the T cells are uh, very important and keeping us um, with other things that we don't know about, probably mm-hmm. keeping us, um, you know, most of the disease is mild if you, you know, yeah, if you look at it, um, it's mild. I mean, I know five hundred people. Are, if you're vaccinated or infected, right, or, or prior recovered. prior infection that you survived, then because yeah. apparently they're both good. Yeah. Um, 
you have a mild infection, which is a good sign. And so the people dying are at risk. And we know in a heterogeneous population, they're always going to be at risk people. Uh, why is a good question. And well, but we, we know the people, the people dying now of COVID-19, in almost all cases, we know what the risks were, at least if I'm, if I'm reading the statistics correctly. You're seeing the, the risk factors we talked about since the beginning of the pandemic. They're very old. They have complicated health problems. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised. Yeah, there are those issues. But then, you know, as as we just discussed with Daniela, there's this whole other issue of how long will your memory last against this? And that's variable, you know, even if you're perfectly healthy. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's 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 great stuff. stuff. And I think that, um, you know, we are just in the time that I've been thinking about some of these things. Um, the way that we've measured some of those memory T cells and the way that we've measured the T cell activation has changed and gotten more sophisticated. So I think that there's a lot more for us to learn on all of that. Sure. And we'll keep covering it as long as we can. Let's do some email. Alan, can you take that first one? Okay. Morrow writes, hello, Vincent and team. I remember many months ago, you said COVID masks and droplets made you realize you might be inhaling poop aerosols from flushing toilets, maybe contaminated with norovirus, for example. Well, now they tested it for you, and it seems you had a point. Commercial toilets emit energetic and rapidly spreading aerosol plumes, and links to a nature paper. Listening to TWIV is one of the highlights of my week. Either TWIV is very good, or I should get a life, or both. Thank you all for making me think and laugh. And this, <laughs> this is I great. think I saw this one in my feed. It got some um, press coverage. Yeah, it definitely got some press coverage. And the the graphics on it are great. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's open access and, and the, the figures, definitely you can just scroll through the figures of the, um, the flushing toilet with a fluorescent dye that... Um, confirms all of your worst fears about flushing one of these lidless close toilets. Close the lid. In, yeah. so you well, if it the has lid. a lid, yes. if it has a lid, I mean, a lot of public restrooms, there's just the the rim, yeah. right? Yeah. Maybe no, they I ought to have say, lids. I mean, I think this has been known for a while that, I mean, it makes sense that it makes an aerosol plume, right? right? Because it's yeah. f- rushing water there. It's yeah. agitating water in a, yeah. Um, I mean... What about a urinal, Alan? I mean, there's no lid. You can't put a lid on There's no urinal. lid. Uh, on the other hand, they're kind of like continuous flush. I mean, it just it just drains down, right? And I think there's still some aerosol probably. There probably is some aerosol, but it's – Someone it's needs to do the less. study with yeah. a urinal. Or, you know, you could do an epidemiological study. Well, also, urine is less infectious inherently. Yeah, I mean there are viruses in there. There are there are viruses right. in there, but just I'm just trying to think of a study that would it would be very difficult to look at men and women and see if there's a difference in certain viruses that are transmitted by urine. Well, right? you could do the the easier study you could do is a study like this with a standard yeah, urinal sure. where you put a fluorescent dye and watch and see what the aerosolization rate is. But variation between men and women is going to be that's um, too complicated. Yeah, many, too many, many other, other factors. Yeah. yeah. But Moro, it's okay to to say it's a highlight of your week. Yeah, I mean, it's a you, highlight you, of my week. You have a you have a life, so yeah. it's fine. I don't think that's a problem. Lisa writes, "Dear Twiv team, thank you so much for the podcast. I learned quite a bit, quite a bit from it. So do I. Immediately after I recovered from COVID a few months ago, my mic- microbiome, which I had been working hard to restore ever since a short course of antibiotics early in the year." suddenly worsened noticeably. I have since done a fair amount of reading to see whether viral infections can affect microbiome and to try to find out what is the mechanism by which they would alter a microbiome. Answers to the first question are easy to find, but I haven't found answers to the second, except as it relates to people with very serious infections being weakened by the infection to where their immune system can't adequately respond to other threats. If a viral infection is far less serious than that, but still changes the microbiome, how does it do it? It seems implausible that the same virus could infect mammalian cells and commensal microbes. Can a virus be that much of a generalist? Thank you again, Lisa in Austin. Great town. Um, 
Yeah. So my first question is, uh, I assume you're having digestive problems, which you've concluded uh, are microbiome driven, um, unless you've done an actual metagenomic sequencing. <laughs> um, but uh, part part of this lies on the assumption that your microbiome is, in fact, dysregulated. And I'm not going to press on how you know that, but let's just say it is. Um, immune response could affect a whole lot of things in the gut. Um, I mean, the gut immune axis, it, actually the gut immune nervous axis is an entire thing, um, which is an area of active research. So um, it could change uh, the environment of the gut in such a way that the bacteria that were there are no longer as able to survive and other species grow out. Um, any kind of a stressor on your system is going to have that kind of an effect potentially. So that would be the mechanism I would go to, um, not so much the virus infecting the bacteria, which <laughs> I, I can't think of an example of a bacteriophage that can infect human cells. I don't even know how that would work. No, no, I think that's correct. Or, vi or an animal virus that could infect bacteria, so right. not happening. Yeah, I mean, inflammation, right? Brian could affect yeah, it as well. Yeah, exactly. I could imagine um, changes to your immune response, changing... The microbes and their metabolites, microbes and their metabolites influencing immune cells and, yeah. you know, all of this influencing the endocrine system and kind of making a very complex web um, that would be hard. And so the, I don't think it's a surprise that you haven't necessarily found an answer to your second question um, as a, it's a, a bit of a complex question to really answer. All right. Can you take the next one, Brianne? Sure. Nancy writes, hello, Twiv. Full disclosure, I'm very cold, seven degrees Fahrenheit and freshly covered with snow in, I think that's Minneapolis, Minnesota, student of Dr. Osterholm, director of SIDRAP, and a registered biosafety professional. I'm writing because I wanted to bring your attention to the many concerns of the recently published surgical N95 paper, if you have not already reviewed them. I heard the study mentioned on a recent TWIV, but the potential flaws and implications of how the study may be used to reduce funding for proper PPE for healthcare workers were not particularly highlighted. I'm hoping you can summarize the challenges with this study for the listeners if you haven't already. I listen to all episodes, but I often don't get a chance until several days after they are published. And she provides two different links um, to this study. I don't think we. Re I don't think we mentioned this study, did we? Does anyone remember? I don't. I don't recall talking about this at all. I don't even recall reading this. I, I don't either. I wondered if it had been something you discussed with Danielle. Could have been, yeah. Um, yeah, we did actually. We did discuss it with Daniel. But there's these two articles linked to uh, by Nancy raise concerns about the study, and you know originally. You know, it said N95 and surgical masks are equally good. <laughs> and and this made people very upset because it shouldn't be, right? Right. And there, there are apparently problems with uh, the study. There's some – It's uh, there are not a lot of people in this study, a few hundred. Um, and the assumption was that they were infected. These are healthcare workers. So the assumption is they're infected or they're – exposed in the hospital, right, where they're wearing either an N95 or a surgical mask. But, you know, they, they leave and they take it off. <laughs> so if you got infected outside, that would skew the results totally, right? So um, I, I think uh, these these concerns are justified. Yeah, yeah. and I don't, I don't want to... Um veer off into ad hominems, but uh, the history of this particular senior author, John Conley, um, is he seems to have um, repeatedly uh, made claims about uh, COVID-19 not being airborne, um, that N95 masks can be harmful because they deprive people of oxygen. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm a little concerned about investigator bias in this like maybe he's decided what the conclusion ought to be but mainly i'd be concerned about the sample size because if you're looking at something like masks we've, we've been talking about this since the beginning of the pandemic these have to be enormous 
studies because the effect size, even in the best studies, is small. And I just, I don't think you can draw any conclusions from when you're talking in hundreds of people. Right. And I think that similarly, one of the other things that becomes complicated in one of these studies, another reason why you need such a huge study is that things like how consistent one is with wearing a mask and, um, you know, those adherence types of factors are also really key. And it looks like um, that was not something that was addressed well in this study at all. Um, and you know, in some ways, you can look at these data and say, hmm, so wearing masks poorly means they're not effective. And, and so I think that you need a lot more to actually make the conclusions that um, people are trying to make from this article. And if the assumption was that because they're healthcare workers, they necessarily got infected at work, that is a big, big assumption um, that I I have not read the study yet, but I'd be surprised if that was really backed up. I yeah. mean, if these are if these were people who were locked up at the hospital, then maybe you could do that. But I that seems like a stretch to me. Especially when you leave, you take your mask off, right? Yeah, of course. Right. You, especially if you're wearing an N95. I mean, they, you're not going to keep that thing on when you're no. so going home. It seems like a study that shouldn't have been done this way, <laughs> right? Maybe it shouldn't well, have been published this way, at least. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's do one more from Leah. Thank you for the excellent podcast. I live in South Africa where we do not allow the import of rabbits – in an effort to protect our endangered riverine rabbit from disease. Unfortunately, a couple of months ago, the most dreaded virus, rabbit hemorrhagic disease virus, was found in our country and has seemed to be spreading, leaving many wild and a few domestic rabbits and hares dead in its wake. None of the vaccines for RHDV have been approved for use in our country, and we're still awaiting to hear if they will be imported. My question for you is, do you have any recommendations for curbing the spread Sounds like the virus is extremely infectious and easily spread. Or do you have any ideas for vaccine import through our vets and government? At this point, I think all bunny owners will take any advice we can get. Oh, boy. Wow. Stopping the spread of a virus in nature. <laughs> well, well, if you have a okay, pet so, rabbit. Yeah, so Leah's question, I'm, get, I'm going to guess that Leah is a bunny owner. Um, yeah. Because that's the concluding sentence. Um, if you have a pet rabbit, then yeah, you can potentially um, prevent this. But uh, if the vaccines have not been approved, then you're at the mercy of that process, which hopefully is relatively quick in South Africa. I have absolutely no idea what the veterinary regulatory procedures are there. I do know that in most countries, it's a lower bar to clear than human medicines, mm. as it should be. Um, so I I hope they can get that cleared for you and you can get your bunny vaccinated. Yeah, so I, 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 I just Googled this virus. <laughs> um, and it does look like it is transmitted by direct contact as well as by mechanical vectors like insects. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe making sure that your bunnies are indoors and not able to be uh, in contact with some of those yeah. um, insects. Um, it also looks like there's some information about how long it can be um, on bedding. And so I would make sure that you were using clean bedding. And um, if the bedding had a poss possibility of being contaminated, maybe getting rid of it. Um, but this is based on my excellent knowledge from Mm -hmm. Two minutes of Google. <laughs> From 30 seconds of Google. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think he, it would be good if you kept uh, the rabbit indoors. I mean, we used to have a rabbit we kept indoors. Um, it was in the basement in a cage, and that was fine. Um, and periodically, you know, in the warm weather, we'd let it, we, we had a cage outside for it. So you could do that, and that would prevent uh, it, it either contacting. Certainly, if you let it run around your backyard, that's going to be a big issue. Yeah. So Yes. That would be good to do. But as far as vaccine import, make a lot of noise. Get all your friends to make noise, write letters and send emails and say, hey, we yeah. want this vaccine imported. What's the problem? And maybe now someone will hear it on, on this program and uh, get moving. 
And and post on social media about it with pictures of your bunnies because that's going to be cute and that's going to get the clicks and that will yeah. hopefully draw the, attention. to The this bunnies cause. would definitely get the clicks. The bunnies would definitely get people on your side. Time I for hope some, no bunny gets hurt. No bunnies were harmed in this. In the what? What is that? No bunnies were harmed in the making of. No this, animals were harmed in the making of this film. Film like or whatever. Or this episode. Yeah. Yeah, this episode. <laughs> Listen. All right, time for some picks. Brianne, what's up this week? I have a pick. Um, it's something someone shared with me on Twitter. Um, so um, there is a uh, article containing a video um, from a website um, that's Quarks and or it's a CBC website. Um, and it shows uh, it's coming from a paper. So I've also linked the paper. But this actually allow, shows some tracking of viral movement outside of cells. So you can see the uh, trace of the virus moving by Brownian motion outside of cells all the way until it interacts with a receptor. Um, so we often talk when we talk about viral um, uh, attachment about you know, how this isn't a directed thing. The virus isn't sort of specifically going for the receptor. It's really just this Brownian motion where sometimes it lucks out and happens upon that right receptor to start entry. Um, and here, um, these authors have actually been able to track and visualize um, a virus outside of a cell all the way until it interacts with a receptor. That's very cool. This is very, very cool. Yeah, I yeah. watched this when I said when I saw the link earlier. It's a, just a neat video that yeah. that they can do this. I, I know it's amazing. So cool. The only thing that's sort of funny is if you watch the video, and I shouldn't say this because it comes from the, the investigators are a Duke and it looks like it's a Duke um, communications video partially. Um, but it's set to really weird music. Yeah. I, felt like the mu I was sort of like, what is, what is up with this music? But other the, than that, it's awesome. Yeah. It, it, the, the very dramatic music that goes with this virus moving randomly by Brownie in motion seems like a little bit of a, a poor fit, but yeah. It's from the paper called capturing the start point of the virus cell interaction with high speed 3d single virus tracking. Which is amazing because when I started working on virus cell interactions, you couldn't do this. We used to dream about it. Yeah. But so here you can actually watch a little purple yeah, it's cool. track. Literally. I think around. I actually had some dreams in graduate school that were about viruses wiggling around. So. <laughs> yeah. Alan, what do you have for us? I, Since people have been doing series of things, I thought, mm -hmm. oh, what could I do a series of? And finally, I settled on something. So I've got... Um, there are going to be five of these um, picks of really innovative and odd indie video games. These are games that, um, I mean, I've played things from big studios, and I'm not going to pick those because everybody's heard of them. Um, but I, there, there are a bunch of games that I've played that have, that have just kind of stuck with me that were from an individual developer or like three people developed it, and, and they just did something radically different with the video game medium. Mm -hmm. So my first pick to give people a flavor of what these are going to be like is a game called The Longing. Um, this is available on Steam. It runs on Windows, uh, Mac, and, and Linux, which is where I played it. Um, it came out March 5th of 2020. And the reason I mention that is that this is a game about hunkering down and waiting for something to happen. It is it is probably one of the strangest video game experiences ever created because in a video game you're supposed to have stuff going on and things to accomplish and and you can speed it up by doing this and and that and master these skills. Um, none of that is in play here. It inverts the entire formula. It's based apparently on a German folk tale about it's kind of a Rip Van Winkle thing, um, some magical king. Um, needs to go underground to rest for 400 days to recover his powers. Hmm. And so, in fact, the beginning of this game, you, you play as a shade, a little goblin character who is the last servant of this king who's holding you in his hand. And he explains that his powers have waned and he needs to go into this underground cavern system to rest. And your job is to wake him up um, in 400 days. You can go longer than 400 days, but it's got to be at least 400 days. And I don't mean game time. I mean, it uses multiple mechanisms to check the clock on your computer. 
and 400 real-time days, you have to wait before you can wake this guy up. So in principle, you could watch the opening cutscene, then quit the game, then come back a year and a half later and, you know, wake up the king and watch the ending cutscene. <laughs> but in fact, there's stuff to explore. You've got a little room off to the side that you can hang out in. You can improve it in various ways. You can wander around the caverns. But the little guy moves really slowly. So he just kind of plods along and occasionally something will happen. And if you try and rush things, um, he'll comment on it and, and say, there's no hurry. <laughs> because you have 400 days. There's nothing nothing we're rushing for. So it's just the antithesis of everything you expect in a game. Yeah, and I, I finished this up um, in 2021. Um, and I, I just, every now and then I think about it still because it is so odd. So I, I highly recommend having this video game experience. It's cool. Very different, right? Very, that very sounds different. sounds really fun. Yeah. Neat. I have two picks, which are basically pages on the Microbe TV website to uh, alert you to, to some interesting things there. The first is what we call the Amy Papers. This So daily, uh, pretty much daily, Amy uh, sends Daniel and I papers that she finds of interest. I mean, she reads every morning, apparently, and just texts us things that she finds interesting. And so I have started to put them on a web page at microbe.tv. Uh, it's called the Amy Papers. And they're just links to the original papers. But you can see, you know, what we're looking at. It's not meant to be comprehensive. Most of them are SARS-CoV-2 COVID papers. But um, – and they're not all good, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them are not as good as others. But they're there because um, they're making some kind of a statement so if you want to see what, what we're thinking about and reading, this is the place for you to go. All right. Um, and now the other thing is that I'll have as a pick probably next week is we we started a Discord channel, and these will be there as well for Microbe TV. But we'll talk more about that next week. So that's the Amy Papers. And the other one is a, a calendar, which uh, resides at microbe.tv slash calendar. And this is a schedule of events for for 2023 live events at national and international meetings, um, uh, live streams and so forth. Um, so this is being done by Steph, who's uh, one of our moderators has taken on this task and, you know, we're going to various meetings. The first one I believe is, uh, in April at, um, is that there's a clinical laboratory meeting that, uh, we're going to, so anyway, if you want to see where we are and if we're going to be in your city and either you come see us or you, we meet up, that's the place to go. So the Amy Papers and Calendar. Cool. Uh, and then we have two listener picks. One is from Judy. I am a long-term, long-time listener of TWIV. I just published a paper in Nature Reviews Microbiology I thought could make for a good listener pick. In this review, we examine the relationship between SARS-CoV-2 and innate immunity and explore how antagonism and dysregulation of innate immunity contribute to COVID-19 severity. It's a comprehensive review with over 200 cited references. It also contains a current summary of the NIH clinical guidelines, but mostly it's a great reminder that there's more to the immune system than just antibodies. So it's innate immune evasion strategies of SARS-CoV-2 by Judith Minkoff and Benjamin Tenuver. And uh, there's a complimentary share link so that you can get a complimentary share link when you publish something. And therefore, you can download something that's behind a paywall. So we'll put that link in. Dr. Tenuver and I put a lot of time and effort into ensuring the accuracy and fair balance of this information. We truly hope it can be of use to the scientific community. Uh, thanks for all you do. It's about 42F, 5.5C, and cloudy here in New York City where I live. Looks like it's going to rain any minute now. Yeah. So thank you for that. And many of our non-scientists will also enjoy it as well. Yeah, I came Excellent. across this review last night um, on Twitter and uh, highlighted it immediately as something I wanted to look at this weekend. Yeah, so I'm good. excited to look at it. Uh, and then Charles writes, hello, Twivers, cold, wet, and just a good day to stay inside. My life partner found this, and I think it's worth watching even on a nice day. Chris Wallace 
asked some good questions. So it is from the program, Who's Talking to Chris Wallace? Season 1, Epitope 30, Dr. Anthony Fauci on HBO Max. It's a CNN show. I don't know if you can stream it from CNN. That's very cool. Very good. Thank you, Charles. That will do it for TWIV 975. Yes, we have 25 epitopes to go to 1,000, which is roughly in uh, in April. So that's cool. We're marching along here. You can find the show notes for all of them at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us your questions, your comments to TWIV at microbe.tv, picks of the week. Uh, and if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash Contribute. Alan Dove is at alandove.com, turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Brian Barker is at Drew University, Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brian. Thanks. It was great to be here. I learned a lot. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of with Ronald Jenkins for the music and Jolene for the timestamps. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.